I'm Philip Evans, and uh, we travel around the U.S., that is, uh, Tyndall House Cambridge does, uh, Peter and some of our other research fellows, about six weeks out of the year. The great thing about doing it in Houston is I get to sleep in my own bed. Because <laughs> I live here, and actually I get to be in my own church this morning, so it's great to be with you. But uh, Tyndall House Cambridge, if you don't get our newsletter, you really should. We've got some sign-up sheets in the back there. You can find out what's going on uh, in biblical research. So, I mean, if you, if you love the Word, if you like to see the Word uh, translated and disseminated accurately, <clears throat> if you like missions on six continents, you'll love Tyndall House. Because what we're about is training uh, the next generation of biblical scholars to go out across the world and uh, spread God's Word in an accurate uh, and uh, fruitful manner. So uh, it's great to be with you this morning. We're going to talk about the Kingdom of God in the series. We're going to talk about friendship this morning. I know you'll enjoy it. Uh, so again, sign up there. Look on your tables, too. There's a bookmark. Uh, when you're uh, reading, you'll think of us, pray for us, hopefully, uh, and uh, use that to bookmark. And on the, on the white side of it, down at the bottom, you'll see stepbible.org. If you want to really step up your Bible study, go to that site, and that's our free <coughs> excuse me, Bible software. Uh, so take a look at stepbible.com or .org. We own both domain names. And uh, you can really enhance your Bible study if you use that going to the original Greek and Hebrew, and just a, a great resource, a free resource, unlike uh, most of the, the software in the, in the West that cost hundreds or thousands of dollars, this is free. Uh, and so it's, it's a great thing. So take a look at that, and I'll turn it over to Pete. Well, good morning. It's so good to be with you. Uh, it's nice to be back with a uh, group that I've been with before. And particularly, I was given this topic, okay? So I had to prepare something specially for you guys. Actually, uh, I have talked on friendship before. It's something that's quite uh, close to my heart. Uh, and I want us to start with looking at the scriptures. The scriptures are going to come up on the screen, but you might want to turn to them. And I want us to think, just firstly, we're going to start with a biblical exercise, looking at every single reference to the word friend, uh, or actually it's a selection of reference, but a representative selection of the word friend in the book of Proverbs. So we're just going to say, what does Proverbs say about friends? And I'm going to get you to uh, try to uh, summarize what's going on. So here we have Proverbs 12, verse 26. The righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. Now, I'm not going to do all the work. I want you to do some of the work. What does this proverb tell us about friendship? Should we have loads of friends? Should we have few friends? How do we go about having friends? And what's the opposite of doing the right thing? So I guess evil could come through someone uh, appearing as a friend. But. That's right. So a friend can have a negative influence on you. So a righteous person is actually going to be choosing the f their friends uh, wisely. And what happens often in a proverb is you get a but in the middle. And also what you find in a proverb is the proverbs actually have in the first phrase and in the second phrase things that don't seem to match. You might expect it to match the righteous chooses their friends carefully and the unrighteous doesn't take any care choosing their friends. I mean, that would be like a contrast, but it doesn't do that, does it? What it says is the way of the wicked leads them astray. Now, why would you not have a proper balanced contrast when you write a proverb? Any thoughts on that? Well, one of the ways that happens is the second phrase informs the first and the first informs the second. So actually you're saying a whole load more like this than you would be with just a balanced proverb. Because one of the things you can get from the second phrase, the way the wicked leads them astray, and there's, there's a but, is that you can think that actually the way of the righteous doesn't lead them astray. So that's part of what you can get from that. But also you can say, well, the wicked um, don't choose their friends uh, carefully. And then there's a connection that's somehow made between choosing friends and the path of life you lead, that the, the way you walk, that actually life is like a journey. And on that journey, you need to take care about the direction of your life. And that is tied up with the issue of friendship. So often people think life decisions, it's all about what career I take 
actually how much have you thought of it in relation to friends some people who isolate themselves from all good influences are actually making a far more significant life decision than they do by taking a particular job have you thought about uh, when you join a company the company that you're joining in another sense of the word let's have a look at this again another one the poor are shunned even by their neighbors but the rich have many friends now back then they didn't have speech marks uh, we don't need speech marks we're gonna look at this what does this tell us about friends come on don't be shy I know it's the morning uh, what does this tell us about friends I mean the rich have more friends I mean it's as simple as that isn't it I mean well you laugh but that's what it says the rich have more friends poor people don't have friends so if you want to have more friends get rich <laughs> sorry what you mean the people are like hangers on yeah leeches you don't think they're real friends no no but it says they're friends in the Bible it says they're friends the Word of God says they're friends yeah well. the rich have more friends so guys get making money today you're gonna get more friends you want more friends you ever feel lonely get money it will solve the problem <laughs> I mean this is the Word of God guys no, they're serious okay what is this telling us that everybody acts as friend is not everyone who acts as a friend is okay so you like there are friends of friends so even though it's using the word friends it's a proverb it's it's there to make you, you you ponder it and you think about what's it really mean and not all friends are real that's a really significant thing and one of the things you observe in life is you can get cynical about the question of friendship there's nothing wrong with that but you can actually see that people become friends for all sorts of reasons other than uh, really pure motives so, so that's why the person who tries to sell you something on the door whatever they want to present themselves as your friends because they want to sell something to you and 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 this never happens in business relationships does it I mean you know people becoming friends for the sake of the business deal no no but actually it's really really profound challenging makes you think about what is a real friend okay and we're gonna think about the whole book of Proverbs together um, <clears throat> a perverse person stirs up conflict but a gossip uh, that's a person who gossips separates close friends any thoughts on this what's this tell us Mark back. let's start over here yeah yeah your, your, your friends are they actually gonna ask tough questions mm-hmm yeah friends ask tough questions we had someone over here yeah the, the friendship is you need to be guarded not Completely cut off, but you, you know, conscious of what's going on around you, <coughs> trying to infiltrate your friendship. Okay, so you need to protect friendship. Friendship is vulnerable to uh, attack, and there are people who who like to stir up uh, conflict where there could be friends gossip. Uh, a gossip can separate close friends just passing on uh, comments and that sort of thing and of course a lot of um, you know a challenge to us about what we uh, decide to pass on whoever would foster love covers over an offense but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends again something quite similar that one of the ways we show love is simply by letting the information stop with us it's you know that we've all got if you know people for long enough you've got dirt on them I mean there are things you can say you know <laughs> uh, and, and, and we, we can we can pull them down and he's a really nice guy but you know and, and then you just pull them down a bit and what you realize is that you can just restrain yourself you don't need to do that you're not unless you're giving a job reference you might want to want to say some things but even then you can just leave it out um, uh, that actually you can separate close friends by passing on information that really shouldn't be there but also another thing it shows me is just how vulnerable friendship is because well I mean a gossip could be someone who makes up false information or they could be someone who passes on true information 
And sometimes even the truth can separate friendship. Actually, there are things that our, our human relationships can be so fragile that actually someone passing on true information can actually make them no longer work. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Any thoughts on this one? So one who is, has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Yeah? Um, I think what I found in life is you only have like maybe one or two of those types of people because it takes time to develop that kind of closeness in a relationship. And hopefully, you know, maybe you got one that really becomes like a true brother. Because what you find in the times of test trials and crises that you don't have a lot of people that you think you know. Okay, so this is really great you sort of anticipated the whole conclusion of my talk but one or two uh, <laughs> one or two uh, really good friends in life uh, uh, is what you might have you're not going to have a whole load and of course the other thing is you might have a whole load of people who are actually unreliable friends and that I mean some people here will have been uh, in crises in their lives and I guess some people at that stage will have been disappointed with the support networks uh, they received. Not everyone, some will have had really great friends stand by them, but some will have been disappointed. And you think, you know, where uh, are my true friends? Let's do some more proverbs. <coughs> Wealth attracts many friends, but even the closest friend of the poor person deserts them. There we are. <laughs> so uh, it's a bit similar to one we've had already. Uh, any, any thoughts on how this might differ or, or extra insight you get from this one? Wealth attracts many friends, but even the closest friend of the poor person deserts them. Your friends of the wealth, not you. Your friends, <coughs> they're friends of the wealth, of not you, yeah. And, and it's quite strong. I mean, it's such a... Now, what you've got to remember is a proverb is not a statement of universal scientific validity. That's not what they're supposed to be. Uh, like rules of the universe, they are general social rules. There are poor people who have friends who stick by them. It's not saying that. It's giving you wisdom for life, um, if you like, maxims, ways of seeing things that will, at the level of generalization, you, they're usually going to prove exactly spot on. Even the closest friend of the poor deserts them. That's something that was not said in the previous one. That actually, what we find is that those who seem to have nothing in this fallen universe with lots of humans, everyone affected by sin, that those who are just vulnerable and people have nothing to get out of it. There's nothing accretive to them. They're just left to one side as an observation about the way the world works. Many, many curry favour with a ruler, and everyone is the friend of one who gives gifts. The poor are shunned by all their relatives. How much more do their friends avoid them? Though the poor pursue them with pleading, they are nowhere to be found. Again, it, it puts even more strongly than we had um, a couple of verses earlier in, in, in uh, Proverbs 19, the same thing. They may beg for you to stay, but actually people don't stay with these people. Whereas the ruler, I mean it's not just the people who are wealthy, but the people who've got influence have many friends. Okay, let's go with this. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered person. Do not associate with one easily angered. Any thoughts on this one? It's a bit different from ones we've had so far. <coughs> Is it just too easy to understand what it means? Go on, yeah. Well, um, it's kind of, like you said earlier, choosing your friends can help direct your path. Do you want to be around a hot-tempered person? That's the righteous behavior that you want to yeah, I mean, the, the, just that way that people can explode, and uh, I, I know uh, um, I don't have uh, a perfect record on, on this sort of uh, area, that, that actually the, um, the 
the way humans can have that thing that boils up inside them like fire and then they, it just uh, comes out and uh, hot tempered and it's something really to be avoided. Okay, wounds from a friend can be trusted but an enemy multiplies kisses. Any thoughts on this one? Sorry? A friend will be honest with you. Friend will be honest with you, yeah. Also, things may not uh, be how they seem. I mean, of course, how does Judas betray Jesus? With a kiss. And what does Jesus say as he comes up? He says, friend, doesn't he? Because actually what you see is enemies love, I mean, th th they can multiply kisses. It can seem really so nice. And actually a, a friend is prepared to wound you by telling you home truths if you like they're, they're, they're prepared to actually be honest with you which can really hurt but be the better thing for you we all might like to be flattered we might want to surround ourselves with people who will, who will tell us how good we are but actually a true friend will speak truth yes I think fostering that in that friendship, the spirit of saying, hey, if you ever see anything in my life that you're concerned about, I want you to let me know. And, and the humility of that, I think, can safeguard us as men from, from really going down some paths that can lead to disaster. Because yeah. I, I wouldn't freely speak something to someone, even though we're friends, without that, in, without that invitation. Um, that, that, that's right. I mean, uh, it, it, unless we invite criticism, it's really hard for people to give it because they know that they're, they're risking a lot. Whereas if you've actually said, you are welcome to criticize me, then the barrier has been greatly lowered. They, the the, the uh, thought that they're going to be rejected uh, has been greatly um, reduced. Perfume and incense bring joy to the heart, and the pleasantness of a friend springs from their heartfelt advice. Do not forsake your friend or a friend of your family, and do not go to your relative's house uh, when disaster strikes you. Better a neighbour nearby than a relative far away. Any thoughts on this one? Relatives may not be friends. Uh, yeah, I mean, we should we can work on that. Uh, I'm not saying we should, uh, but I mean, what it is saying is yes, friends. Uh, you, you can find friends can actually uh, be better than family. I mean, you know, uh, family uh, are often uh, very very close, but uh, we need to. Um, Often what we can think is family first, friends last. And I'm not saying we should in any way neglect our families, but I am saying that we should put a priority on cultivating real friendship. Do not f uh, forsake your friend or a friend of your family. Okay, so that was um, Proverbs. Now I want us to do just, we're going to look at Psalms next. What summary thoughts do you get having looked at the whole of Proverbs on the question of friends? How does Proverbs view friends? Cautious. Cautious. Very good, yep. Be smart selecting your friends. Sorry? Be smart when you select your friends. Yeah, be, yeah, be smart yeah, when you select your friends. Yep. Valuable. Valuable. So, valuable Friends are really valuable, and yet there's actually a lot of caution, uh, negativity about the way friends are viewed. Uh, so there are friends and friends, there are true friends. In fact, it seems to me there are more pr proverbs which are negative about friendship than there are that are positive. Now, it, it, some of them are really positive, you know, the nearby friend, uh, better than the far off relative. Um, the great value on friendship, so friendship is not devalued, but what we see is there's an awful lot of fake friendship around. Let's look at the book of Psalms. What does the book of Psalms say about friendship? It's what the psalmist says, Psalm 31. Because of all my enemies, I am the utter contempt of my neighbours and an object of dread to my closest friends. Those who see me on the street, flee from me. This is David writing. Uh, tell us about what this tells us about friendship. Um, that people sometimes are only there uh, when it's good. Mm -hmm. and, and here's an example of the big friends, right? They turn and run when you're having yeah. I mean, obviously, David had a great friendship with uh, Jonathan, although it mainly was initiated from Jonathan's side. Jonathan really stuck by him, but then Jonathan died early. 
So we're probably at a later stage in, in David's life. What's David's experience of friendship? Not good. Not good. I mean, you, you actually think about how many friends did David have, uh, you know, through his life, and actually, it's not a great record. Um, let's look at this one. Uh, my friends and companions avoid me because of my wounds. My neighbours stay far away. How are friends doing there? Not good. Let's look at this one. Psalm 41. Even my close friend, someone I trusted, one who shared my bread, has turned against me. How's the friend doing? Not good. Anyone see any echoes of this of anything else in the Bible in this one? <coughs> Sorry? He's been wounded, yeah. Also Judas. Judas. Judas, of course. Now the point about this, this is that this and many of the references to friends in the Psalms are actually foreshadowing David's betra uh, um, Jesus is betrayed by Judas. Because remember, David is bef betrayed by the counsellor Ahithophel, who goes off and hangs himself. Judas goes off and hangs himself. There are some parallels there between the life of David, who has his own son rise up against him and try and become king. Um, uh, we, we see those parallels uh, in between David's life and Jesus' life, which is quite the way it's, it's uh, supposed to be, that, that David is a pale reflection of Jesus. And so much of these texts are prophetic. But the point is this, as we read through the book of Psalms, we haven't yet found a good reference to friends. <clears throat> Psalm 55. If an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide it. But it's you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God as we walked about among the worshippers. Again, huge disappointment as um, someone experiences the betrayal of their closest friend. Keep going in Psalms. My companion attacks his friends. He violates his covenant. His talk is as smooth as butter, yet war is in his heart. His words are more soothing than oil, yet they are drawn swords. I'll keep going on because I think we're getting the same theme. You have taken from me my closest friends and made me repulsive to them. I'm confined and cannot escape. You have taken from me friend and neighbour. Darkness is my closest friend. In return for my friendship, they accuse me, but I'm a man of prayer. They repay me evil for good and hatred for my friendship. That's the book of Psalms on friendship. Not a good thing to say. No good experience of friendship mentioned in the Psalms. Now, is it just Proverbs and Psalms that talk about it? No. What about Job's three friends? How do they do? <laughs> well, they did come and they did wait seven days without saying anything. There's a sincerity to it, to, to it. But unfortunately, they didn't end up being really good in Job's experience, let's say. Jeremiah. Beware of your friends. Do not trust anyone in your clan, for every one of them is a deceiver, and every friend a slanderer. Friend deceives friend, and no one speaks the truth. They have taught their tongues to lie. They weary themselves with sinning. How's Jeremiah's experience of friendship? Not good. Okay, Lamentations. Second verse of the book. Talking about Jerusalem. Bitterly she weeps at night, tears are on her cheek. Among all her lovers there is no one to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her. All her friends have betrayed her. They've become her enemies. Obadiah. All your allies will force you to the border. Your friends will deceive and overpower you. Those who eat bread with you will set a trap for you, but you will not detect it. Micah. Do not trust a neighbour. Put no confidence in a friend. Even with the woman who lies in your embrace, guard the words of your lips. Now, I'm not using this in marriage counselling, by the way. Uh, but but it, it's interesting, isn't it? Okay. Zechariah. If someone asks you, what are these wounds in your body? They will answer, the wounds I was given at the house of my friends. One of the things that strikes me when I just take the whole sweep of the Old Testament and look at the subject of friends is how there's far more negative, far more disappointment than there is positive. Now, it's not that friends aren't valued. The book of Proverbs tells us clearly that a really good friend is extremely valuable. But actually, we need to remember that... Um, there's a lot of disappointment with friendship. An awful lot of disappointment. 
When we come on uh, to the New Testament, I've already talked about how Jesus was betrayed with a kiss and of course every one of his disciples abandoned him. They're not specifically called friends most of the time in the New Testament, but those he'd chosen to be his closest companions abandoned him. And so, if you have had negative experiences with friendship, it may be small comfort to you, but you're not alone. Many, many people have had precisely that experience. Well, is that all we have to say? No, there are some more positive things to say. But I thought I'd begin with the bad news. Uh, that friendship in the world can be very, very disappointing. Now, that doesn't, we don't have to be fatalist and say, leave it there that friendship is always going to be disappointing, but the Bible speaks the truth about this and tells us the things the way they are. Now, how many friends does God have in the Bible? How many people are called friend of God? You know the answer? One. Who is it? Abraham is the only person in the Bible called friend of God. Oh, the only person called friend of God. Here we have 2 Chronicles 20 verse 7. Our God, <coughs> did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? Isaiah, or you might say Isaiah, but you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I've chosen, you descendants of Abraham, my friend. And as the book of James looks back at the Old Testament. It says, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. They notice as they read the Old Testament, the striking thing that Abraham is called God's friend. So thrice, three times in the Bible, Abraham is called God's friend. Why does God only have one friend? I mean, does it mean we can't sing what a friend we have in Jesus? No, I think we can sing it. I mean, it's, it's, it's great words, great tune. And Jesus is our faithful friend. Um, and the, the Bible doesn't call God our friend. Now, of course, with our friend, there can be other baggage that our culture has. For instance, we think of friends as in an egalitarian way. You're on the same rank as your friends. And so if your friend became president, you would expect them not to talk down to you, you know, when that happened or something like that. Um, uh, but actually, friend doesn't have to be equal friendship. Friends, friendship is to do with faithfulness, not to do with uh, equality of rank. Now, and that may be hard for us to uh, get that when we're in an egalitarian society, but actually that's really important. Abraham's God's friend. Okay, God only ever has one friend. Why does he only have one friend? Is it because he's unfriendly? No. No. <laughs> good. That's a good answer. Yeah. The standards are extremely high. The standards are extremely high. Yeah. Good. Abraham had great faith, and this was before the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, Abraham had great faith. This was before the Holy Spirit. Any other answer on that? Few chose God as their friend. Sorry? Few chose God as their friend? Okay. So you think it was really because Abraham chose God, not because God chose Abraham, yeah? We'll see. Well, I want to put it to you like this. God may only have one friend, but think what a good job he did on the friendship. He blessed Abraham. He blessed all his descendants. He blessed all the families of the earth through him. He said, all of the families on earth are going to be blessed through you. And you could read the entire story of the Bible as God showing his faithfulness in a superb way to one friend and blessing his offspring and making it so that people from all the nations become his descendants. Do you see? So in other words, it's not to do with the number of friends you have, it's to do with how well you handle that friendship. Now, there's different words used for the word friend in the Bible, and someone might say that my study isn't quite scientific, I'm just working off what comes out in as friend uh, English, English translation. But I think what we can say is, um, of course God is faithful to every one of us. And we can claim, I think, legitimately extrapolate from the Bible that God's our friend and we're his friend. So I'm happy singing what a friend we have in Jesus. I think that's great. But when we're just studying the Bible language, that word isn't coming out. Do you, do you understand? So you've got the Bible language is one thing, but that doesn't mean we can't say based on the way God acts towards us. I mean, we've never had anyone so faithful, as the song goes, can we find a friend so faithful? And the answer is no one. 
Can we find anyone who loves us more? No one. Of course, everything that we would say of a, of a good friend, um, we, we have with God. So yes, God's our friend, and we're God's friends. But just in terms of the Bible themes, there's one person who gets called God friend, and he does an amazing job on the friendship. And I just think that's an encouragement to us. Now, how many friends uh, should you have? Um, well, God is also said to speak to Moses as one speaks with a friend. It doesn't quite call Moses a friend. I want to have a look at um, this verse, uh, set of verses from John 15. Sorry, it may be a bit small. I'll read it. Jesus speaking to his disciples before he goes away. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down his life for one's friends. That's a definition of uh, the love of a friend. I love this line. You are my friends if you do what I command. Now try using that with your friends. <laughs> you, are your, you are my friends if you do what I command. I mean, one of the really striking things about that is you can't use it with your friends. They won't stay friends if you try that one out. Um, but of course, Jesus doesn't have friendship on an equal footing with us, as if he's equal with us. He's far above us. But a condition of fr uh, friendship there uh, is that we do what he commands. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know what his master's business is. Instead, I call you friends. For everything I've learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that uh, whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. If the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. And so on. One of the key things that distinguishes a servant from a friend if someone says to their servant, do this, but they don't say why, the friend they speak to, they communicate with, they share information with. And that's absolutely a key hallmark of friendship today. We have to be open with each other. We, uh, the, the more you keep your own thoughts, your own struggles inside your mind and don't share them with well-chosen people, the more you're cutting off friendship you're not really treating people as true friends and so i'd urge you each one of us not to go and and share the deepest things that you necessarily feel uh, in the small groups here that may be people that you haven't met before i'm saying choose a few people very wisely to befriend and part of befriending is that you open up to them as it says in the book of psalms one of the verses I missed out. I am a friend to all who fear you, to all who follow your precepts. That actually there's another way of being friends, and that is very similar to what we see with Jesus. A friendship based on the fact that we all follow God's commands and the, the common adherence to, G, to Jesus. This is what it says in James. Adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who choose, chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. We're also in a situation where there's a common enemy and a common friend. God is the one we should be serving, and every single one of us who serves God actually becomes a friend of each other in a way. So, how is friendship viewed in the Bible? Anyone want to summarise so far? We've got a little bit more to do, so we're not, there may be some surprises, but how is friendship viewed in the Bible? It's rare. Sorry? It's rare. It's scarce. It's rare, scarce, yeah. Good, bad, and ugly. Good, bad, and ugly. Okay, yeah. Great. Anyone else? Valuable. Valuable. Excellent. How many friends does God have? We looked at that. Well, he has one it, by one definition, but he has many, many, many uh, in terms of what he shows his faithfulness to each one of us. <clears throat> how good a God, job does God do on the friendship? He does an amazing job. Let's ask this question, how many friends do I have? How many friends do you have? I'm not asking you to answer this out loud. Um, but also the question, how many friends should I have? Now, it's some be that some people, it may be that some people have no friends and they need to increase the number. It may be for some people they have 
too many friends, which of course raises the question of whether they're real friends at all. For instance, uh, this is a picture of my Facebook page. And uh, where's the number? Somewhere in there. It does say the number. 1,461 apparently, somewhere it's a small print uh, here. Uh, and I probably don't know most of their names. Um, and I see I've got, I've got a few extra requests in here. Uh, that's one definition of friendship. This is an email I got nine days ago. A Kuwaiti man has just moved from Birmingham to Cambridge, where I live in England. <coughs> uh, his English is almost non-existent, but he's, not, uh, he's keen not to meet any more Arabs or Pakistanis. Sorry, that's just what it said. Okay? Um, though he can't speak English, he's got a job in a Lebanese restaurant. I've only met this guy once, but he was passed on to me by a local evangelist. Can you or anyone else you know adopt this guy? For an Arab, friendship is meeting someone every day or at least once a week. If you can help, I'll pass on his number. Many thanks. Paul, who's a friend of mine. Whew. Interesting, isn't it? Someone you meet every day. Or at least once a week. Okay, let's use this definition. This definition of friend for a moment. How many friends do you have? How many has got more than zero? Anyone here got more than zero? That's great. Bless you. That's wonderful. <laughs> that is that is good. You know. But actually, you know. So you, you have this sort of definition of friends. You know. How many friends do you have like that? Well, just you know, loads of friends, loads of friends. You know. Like this definition. How many friends do you have? Numbers pretty small. Okay. Let's just go on those people who had more than zero. Anyone got two friends of this kind? Yeah. Exactly. It's interesting, isn't it? Now, obviously, there's a cultural thing there. We, we, we live in a busy society, society that um, puts a lot of um, store on productivity. Nothing against productivity, but you sometimes wonder, what are you producing for? You know, I mean, what, what, what's, the, what's the aim? You know, uh, for other people, friendship uh, is, is more of a uh, virtue. <clears throat> well, what should we have? Well, actually, the Bible is not against having lots of friends. Here is a book of Acts. Paul is, has been arrested. Uh, he's appealed to Caesar. He is on the journey to Rome. He's in the ship. And they stop off at the port of Sidon. Acts 27 verse 3. Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends to be cared for. Now, c come on. Paul's friends in Sidon. And actually, literally, it is the friends, not his friends. So just like, you know, the, the, the Quakers call themselves the Society of Friends, the, the idea that the early Christians call themselves friends. They're all serving a common master, they're all serving uh, a common lord, and they're friends. And what's really interesting here is that Paul arrives in a place that he may never have been to before, uh, and he just gets off the boat, and he has friends. And I'd say that's my experience. I've you know, come to Houston on a number of occasions, and I've met people, and just on meeting them, we really are friends. No, no, we're not deep friends. We're not lifelong friends. We're not uh, friends who are going to meet every day. But I can't deny that in the Christian faith, the fact that we have, uh, we serve a, a common cause, we have a common love for Jesus, we really are friends. There's a reality to that. The way C.S. Lewis defined the difference between lovers and friends, he said lovers face each other. He said, friends sit alongside each other, admiring something else. And I just found that a really helpful way of thinking about friends, that your common love for something else can make you friends. And our common love for Jesus makes us friends. So how many friends do I have? Well, I'd like to count you all as friends, but we mustn't get from that to kid ourselves about how many people are going to stick by us and phone us up when we get into difficulty. That's the thing we've got to think about. We've got to work on that whole question. Um, this is another thing Jesus himself said. Everyone who's left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. I, I think so many of us exper have, have experienced how many houses we have. I mean, I just have hundreds and hundreds of houses. What I mean is uh, that, you know, uh, the, okay, I don't have the, the title deeds to them, but there are just so many places where I have been welcomed. 
and, and, and it's because uh, these people are serving Christ and I'm seeking to serve Christ and we just find that there are so many places that you can go and there is an amazing thing is the worldwide church is built that all of these resources are all ours <laughs> we have just joined the club with the greatest resources in the world there is no club which is, has as much common pooled resources as the church, the assembly, the body of Jesus Christ. It is quite phenomenal. There is nothing to match that. And that means we can go around the world and find friends. And fi we could be doing missions, finding hospitality. Of course there's hospitality outside the church. I'm not denying that. But within the body of Christ, there is just such amazing hospitality and such amazing chances for friendship. So how many friends do we have? Well, I think we need to make a distinction here, don't we? We need to make a distinction between um, how we have so many friends because we all love Jesus. Together we sit alongside, we love Jesus and we're friends together. That's at one level. But then we also need to look at uh, uh, um, uh, another level and that is we are all really limited in time and space. How many people can we really share our lives with, share our thoughts with, be accountable to, uh, know deeply, ensure we're going to be there for them whatever happens and uh, have it so that we can reasonably expect that they're going to be there for us. Of course you can be let down by friends, uh, that was Jesus' experience, um, but that's another level we need to look at and perhaps for, for many of us we need to be thinking not about quantity but about quality. Friends are often false, we need to be good friends, every single one of us, and let's choose quality over quantity. God had one friend and he did a really good job and I think that challenges us. How good a friend am I? So I don't want us to go away from this and think how many friends do I have, how can I make sure I've got the right number of friends? I want us also to think how can I be a better friend? Um, and maybe what that means is choosing one person. Jesus said, I chose you when he's speaking to his friends. Choosing one person, we're going to be for, there for whatever. If they move out of state, their marriage gets in trouble, we're going to get in the car for them. That, that's what I mean. We, we're not just, we, we're, we're going to be there for, for them. Don't try and do that and promise that to 10 people. But a few people, maybe just one, you know, that's what we should be thinking about, being really deliberate about it. 